Becky, am I sharing? No, not yet. Okay. Let's see, share screen. Okay, I thought I had everything set up, silly me. There we go. All right, now we're talking, right? Yep, Sherelle, you can see it? Okay, great. All right, everybody. So um, today isn't going to be as complicated intellectually as last week or as next week will be, but I think that it might be more challenging um, personally and psychologically. So I give that by way of a preamble. There's a lot of text today. Don't worry about reading all the text. You will get this as a PowerPoint if you want to read what Rombaum says yourself. I will be reading and kind of skipping around while I'm reading so that we have time to get through some of these major concepts. And it's a pretty major concept today. It's the goal of life, right? What is it all about, Alfie? and how the Torah helps us achieve this goal. So this is the very first halakha from the Mishneh Torah, right? This is front and center, the be all and the end all. And it's all Greek, written in Arabic, sorry, written in Hebrew, it's written in Hebrew, but it is all Greek. The foundation of all foundations and the pillar of wisdom is to know that there is a primary being who brought into being all existence. All the beings of the heavens, the earth, and what is between them came into existence only from the truth of his being. That is halakha. That is Jewish literature, and that is pure Greek. Notice that the operative word here is no, as opposed to what we find, I would say, in the entire rabbinic tradition, which is not about knowing, but it's about morality. So we have Hillel, we have Rabbi Akiva, and then in the middle here, we have Ben Azai. And so Ben Azai is about morality, but it's couched in the language of human dignity. As a result of every human being create as a result of every human being having been created in the divine image, you need to accord every human being that level of dignity, right? And then we've got Hillel, don't do what's hateful. Rabbi Akiva is quoting Leviticus 19.18, right? Show love to your neighbors, to yourself. That's what Rambam inherited. He inherited morality and dignity from the tradition. These are the Klal Gadol B'Torah, right? The question was asked, what's the most important principle in the Torah? Rabbi Akiva and Ben Azai gave these two answers. And we see how Rambam begins his Mishneh Torah to know that there is a primary existent, who, a necessary existent, who causes all other contingent existences to exist for a finite period of time. Okay, that's what it's all about. So now the question is, so is that what Judaism is? Is that what Judaism does? What's the relationship between the goal of life to know this primary existent and the 613 mitzvot that Rambam writes a 14 volume legal code explicating? Like, is he just, what's he doing? Okay, so the first thing I want to do actually is to introduce to you something that Rambam wrote when he was still in his 20s, which was the introduction to the Mishnah. In the last chapter of the Talmudic Tractate of Sanhedrin, it begin, it's called Perak Helek, 
because it begins every Jew, every Israelite has a chelik, has a piece of Olam Haba of the coming world. So he wrote about the nature of this coming world in his introduction to that chapter, and he called it Parachelik. And in that introduction, he explicates three different approaches to religious literature. So he says the first way that people read or can read religious literature is to read it literally. And those people who read it li literally and believe it, <clears throat> they're pathetic. That's the word he uses, well, in Arabic. Now, now he is writing in Arabic. They're pathetic. They're, you know, we can all figure out who those people are today who claim to be biblical literalists, biblical fundamentalists, Rambam has no problem in calling them pathetic. They distort and pervert the Torah. That same approach to reading the Torah, reading it literally, but then rejecting it, they're even more foolish and inane than the first group. And those are the people who have been dubbed the undergraduate atheists. People like Daniel Dennett, um, people like... Uh, Richard Dawkins, people who read the Torah literally and say, look how primitive this document is. Why would anybody want to have anything to do with Christianity or Judaism? Look at these texts. They're disgusting and immoral. That's right. So Rambam, Rambam would be happy to have them go away and would be um, uh, it would contribute to them going away. But that's not the world in which we live. They get a platform just like everybody else. How should we read religious literature according to Rambam? figuratively. And those who read the Torah figuratively, when it's appropriate to do so, are the truly wise. And so now we are going to see a couple of examples of Rambam reading what I assume, but I'm not going to assume, um, is literature that is fairly familiar to most of you, but we will go through the texts. Okay, so this is in the Mishneh Torah, this is in the Law Code, and it is the first running biography of Abraham Avinu, right, of Abraham. So during the times of Enosh, right, Enosh was one of these people after Cain and Abel, after, um, after the flood, but before Abraham. During the times of Enosh, humanity made a great mistake. They said that God created stars and spheres to control the world. That wasn't their mistake. That's what they said. God placed them on high and treated them with honor, making them servants who minister before God. Accordingly, this is their mistake. It is fitting to praise and glorify them, the stars and the spheres, and to treat them with honor. They perceived this to be the will of God, blessed be he, that they, the people, magnify and honor those whom God magnified and honored by placing them up in the heavens, just as a king desires that the servants who stand before him be honored. Indeed, doing so is an expression of honor to the king. So what they do? After figuring this out, they began to build temples to the stars and to offer sacrifices to them, the stars. They would praise and glorify them with words and bow down because by doing so, they would, according to their false conception, be fulfilling the word of God, be fulfilling the will of God. It didn't start out maliciously. It didn't start out being a terrible mistake, but eventually, they began to forget that there was a God who had placed those stars and spheres in the heavenly orbits in order to control the planetary motions. This was the essence of the worship of false gods, and it was the rationale of those who worship them. They would not say that there is no other God except for this star right? Not at that point. People would gather together and bow down to them, and the false prophets would say, this image is for the benefit of man. It's appropriate to serve it and fear it, and the priests would tell them, this service will enable you to multiply and be successful, do this or that, or don't do this or that. 
right? So far, so not terrible. But subsequently, over time, over generations, the psychology of religion, Maimonides, a great psychology psychologist of religion, says, other deceivers arose and declared that a specific star or sphere angel had spoken to them and commanded them, serve me in this manner. He would then relate a mode of service telling them, do this and don't do that. The eternal rock, let me just make sure I'm getting this. Yeah. The eternal rock was not recognized or known by anyone in the world with the exception of a few people. The world continued in, uh, in this fashion until the pillar of wisdom, sorry, until the pillar of the world, the patriarch Abraham was born. Okay. So let's just review the bidding. Ramam is telling us about the emergence of idolatry. There was a good faith effort among the children of Enoch, of Enosh, sorry, of Enosh, that they wanted to honor those who God seemingly honored. So they built temples to the stars and to the, to the planets that God put up in the heavens. And then over time, it was forgotten or there were deceivers, there were charlatans who came in and said that it was those stars and planets who were the actual gods and that this is how you need to worship them. That remained the way of the world except for a handful of individuals until Abraham was born. Now, what did Abraham bring to the table? And this is answering the question, why Abraham? Okay, that's, that's the question of the Midrash that we're reading. And this is an extended biographical Midrash. After this mighty man was weaned, he began to think critically, right? As soon as he was weaned, put on his thinking cap, he's thinking critically. Though he was a child, he began to think throughout the day and night, wondering, how is it possible for the sphere to continue to revolve without anyone controlling it? Who's causing it to revolve? It can't cause itself to revolve. He didn't have a teacher. No one was there to inform him. He was mired amongst the foolish idolaters in Ur Kazdim. His parents were part of that intellectual milieu. And his parents would worship these stars and spheres in these temples. But the whole time, Abraham's heart was exploring. It was wandering. It was going around trying to figure things out. And he was gaining understanding here until ultimately he figured it out. He appreciated the way of truth and understood the path of righteousness through his accurate comprehension. Remember, right? Maimonides says that the purpose of life is to know about this primary existence. Abraham has fulfilled his purpose. He realized that there was one God who controlled the sphere. God created everything. There was no other God. He knew that the entire world was barking up the wrong temple tree. What caused them to err was their service, their worship of the stars and images, which made them lose awareness of the truth. Abraham was 40 years old when he became aware of his creator. So it didn't happen overnight. He was 40. When he recognized and knew him, he began to formulate replies to the other people of Orkhav's deem and to debate with them, telling them that they were not following a proper path. He broke their idols and began to teach the people that it is fitting to serve only the God of the world. To God alone is it fitting to bow down, sacrifice, and offer libations so that the people of future generations would recognize them. Conversely, it's fitting to destroy and break all those images of the idols, lest people make mistakes concerning them, like those people who thought that there are no other gods besides these images. When he overcame them, the other people in Orca's in name, through the strength of his arguments, 
the king got upset and wanted to kill him because the king got a slice of all those sales of idols, right? So Abraham was cutting in on his tax revenue. Abraham was saved through a miracle and left for Haran. There he began to call in a loud voice to all the people and inform them that there is one God in the entire world and it's proper to serve only him. He would get on his soapbox and call out to the people, gathering them in city after city and country after country until he came to the land of Canaan, proclaiming God's existence the entire time as it states, and he called there in the name of the Lord, the eternal God. When people would gather around him and ask him about his statements, he would explain to each of them according to their understanding until they turned to the path of truth. Ultimately, thousands and myriads gathered around him. These are the men of the house of Abraham. That was a lot. Time to stop. Take it all in for a second. Why did Abraham leave Ur Kazdim? Because the king put a contract out on him. Why did he go to Canaan? No reason. He just went in that direction. Did God speak to Abraham? And say, Lech Lecha? Not according to that biography. But you know what? Rambam spends the first 36 chapters of the Guide of the Perplexed explaining that all of those descriptions of God having a body or having feelings that are all over the Bible. You should read those figuratively because God doesn't have a body. And if God doesn't have a body, it means that God doesn't have a vocal box or God doesn't have a throat or vocal cords or mouth or lips. And without those things, it makes speaking, at least the way we understand speaking, to be impossible. So, what Rambam is saying, and now I will go back. Is that when it says, God said to Abraham, go forth from your native land and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. You need to read that figuratively, folks. Because God doesn't speak. And that land that god will show abraham this is hard this is hard but for rambam ain't nothing special about the land of israel that just happens to be where abraham ended up when he was on the lamb from the king of ur Kazdim, trying to escape the death sentence that, in, that 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 had been put out on him this bottom quote Abram took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot and all the wealth they had amassed and the Nifashot that they had acquired in Haran and they set out for the land of Canaan. So most translations are going to have this not as persons but as cattle. But it could theoretically mean persons and that's how Rambam is reading it. Ultimately, thousands and myriads gathered around him. These are the men of the house of Abraham. Those are the people that he took to Canaan. So, Sherelle, I think this might be, um, if there are, I don't know if there are any questions or comments. Yes, um, and many of them with caps lock about this story, <laughs> about the story you just told. So in favor of those who are hearing this story or this type of biography of uh, Abraham for the first time, can you say a, a little about the origins of this story and where Rambam gets it from? Okay, so some of the pieces that Rambam brings to the story are midrashic. So when it says that um, that Abraham that Abraham broke their idols, 
that is a midrash, but the midrash is that Terach, Avram's dad, had an idol shop, and Avraham took the broom handle and smashed the idols. If you read what Rambam wrote about Abraham figuratively, what it means is that Avraham was an iconoclast, and he broke their mental idols. He broke, he smashed, he destroyed what they had thought of as their idea of God. So a piece of the biography that we just read is from Midrash, but a piece is also from, wait for it, Muhammad. Because Muhammad similarly went around from place to place and was telling people about his vision of God. And so this idea to Jewish Arabs or to Arab Jews would have been familiar to them from their stories in the broader majority culture of the primary prophet of Islam. So those are the two places where Rambam gets it. He doesn't make up the story of whole cloth, but he takes bits and pieces from his um his geographical culture and his religious culture and puts them together. Okay, so since you mentioned Muhammad, another question about uh, uh, if and how much is there an effect of Sufi tradition on Rambam's thought? So um, nothing today that I can think of. Wait for next week. Next week is Rambam and his son, Avraham Maimonides. and. Abraham Maimonides was far more um, accepting of Sufi insights. And you see that in Maimonides as well toward the very end of the guide. So we'll be looking at that next week. So the answer is Rambam was absolutely influenced by Sufism, but not in this week's material. You'll see it in next week's material. Okay, uh, another question. This rebuke of idolatry, is it aimed specifically to Greek or Roman or Christian religions, or is he talking about it or referring to the story in a more general way regarding idolatry? Yes. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, he's living in an Arab milieu, so both the Jews and the Muslims look at Christianity as idolaters. Um, he's also coming to explain how how Abraham got to be the person that God selected. And so there is a midrash based on a line in the Torah that at the time of Enosh, people began calling on the name of God. And that word began has a het lamed root. And that het lamed root is the same root that you have in Chilul Hashem. A desecration of God's name. So you've got, you know, as I said, you've got these midrashic motifs that are being weaved together along with what is kind of common cultural folklore. Sherelle, anything else or can I go on? Um, there are questions about the application of what you said relating to Israel and Zionism. Um, do you want to answer okay. that? Yeah, now? so I will answer that and then I will go on. So Rambam would be very sympathetic to arguments about maintaining the land for purposes of security. Rambam would be, would reject the idea as idolatrous that the land has any kind of inherent Kedusha. No, nothing has inherent holiness except God. God is the only thing that has inherent holiness. What makes a place holy is what happens at that place or on that piece of land. It's not that there can't be something that could be figurative, figuratively described as holy land, but it's not that the land is holy. It's that what the people do on that land is worshiping God. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. All right, now we're going to talk about prophecy. So if I were to ask people, 
what is prophecy? You would say something like it's when God communicates to human beings. That is not what the philosophical tradition understands prophecy to be. Here we go. Prophecy is, her, is a certain faculty in human beings who are in a state of intellectual perfection. You can only be a prophet through studying. So all those shepherds and all those people who were out in the fields who had prophetic encounters, first of all, it was all in a dream. But second of all, they were all philosophers. You can't be a prophet. It is impossible, impossible to be a prophet without being a philosopher. Accordingly, it's impossible that an ignorant person should be a prophet. There you go. But if a person perfect in his intellect and moral faculties and also perfect as far as possible in his imaginative faculty so that he can teach what he learns, if that person prepares himself in the manner which will be described, he must become a prophet. In other words, if he tunes into that level of divine truth, he will be a prophet. And then Rambam says, well, we believe that God could withhold that prophecy if God so wanted. But prophecy is a natural faculty of human beings. You can imagine it as a, the divine intellect and truth as a radio wave going out from a transmitter. And if your intellect can pick up that signal, that radio wave, that's prophecy. It's available 24-7, all the time, to men and women. You just have to work for it. You just have to study. You just have to attain, and good luck with this, you just have to attain intellectual perfection. Okay. Now, what about the prophecy of Moses? Is Moses any different? It's clear to me that what Moses experienced at Mount Sinai was different from that which all the other Jews experienced because Moses alone was addressed by God. And for this reason, the second person singular is used in the Ten Commandments. Moses then went down to the foot of the mountain and told his fellow men what he had heard. But Moses alone heard. See, I stood between the Lord and you at that time to tell you the word of the Lord. Huh. So that's how he's interpreting that verse in Deuteronomy. Again, Moses spoke and God answered him with a loud voice. Huh. What's that loud voice? In the Midrash, the Mechilta is a, a, an early Midrash on the book of Exodus. Our sages say explicitly that Moses brought to them every word as he had heard it. In other words, they didn't hear it from God themselves. Furthermore, furthermore, the words, in order that the people hear when I speak with you, which is what God says, shows that God spoke to Moses and the people only heard the mighty sound appear, a loud voice, not distinct words. The people at Sinai did not hear God's speech. They just heard a loud sound, the mighty sound. Okay, I I'm going to stop here for a second. Um, not everybody at Mount Sinai was a philosopher. And therefore, they could not understand that loud voice that they heard. Moses might not have been the only one to understand the words, but the people in general didn't. Okay. This is intellectual elitism. On the mystical side of Judaism, there's racism and the idea that Jews are inherently, intrinsically more divine than other people. That's on the mystical side. And on the philosophical side, there's the idea that the only people who can access God's will are intellectually perfect. 
So on the philosophical side, we have intellectual elitism. What Rambam is going to do now is to explain what the Torah is all about. Rambam says that the only pieces of the revelation at Mount Sinai that were true, that were correct, was that God exists and that God is one, simple and unified. All those other 611 commandments have two purposes. Here we go. The general object of the law of Torah is twofold. The well-being of the soul and the well-being of the body. The soul for Rambam is the intellect. The soul for Rambam is the mind. Therefore, the well-being of the soul is promoted by correct opinions. Communicated to the people according to their capacity. Some of these opinions are imparted in a plain form and others are allegorical. You have to read them figuratively because certain opinions are in their plain form too strong for the capacity of the common people. They will freak out. They will no longer participate as compliant, obedient subjects in the kingdom. The well-being of the body is established by the proper management of the relations in which we live to one another. In other words, politics. This we can attain in two ways. You have to remove the bad stuff from our midst, the violence. That is to say that we don't, that we do not do every person as he pleases, desires, or is able to do, but every one of us does that which contributes towards the common welfare. So you get rid of the bad stuff. Secondly, by teaching every one of us good morals so that we produce a good social state. Of these two objects, the one, the well-being of the soul, or the communication of correct opinions, comes undoubtedly first in rank. It's more important. But the other one, the well-being of the body, the government of the state, and the establishment of the best political system, comes before in nature and time. In other words, first, you need to have a well-functioning society. First, you need to have a, a civilization, a culture, where people are treating each other well so that you can attain those things that the body needs, like food and clothing and peace of mind that you're not fighting the Russians or fighting the Arabs or fighting fill in the blank. Because you need that time in order to perfect your soul through study. Because that's the only way to perfect your soul, through intellectual perfection obtained through study. The latter object is required first, meaning the welfare of the body is required first. It's also treated in the Torah most carefully and most minutely. That's why we've got all these laws relating to the political structure of society. Because the well-being of the soul can only be obtained after that of the body has been secured. It's clear that the second and superior kind of perfection can only be attained when the first perfection, first perfection has been acquired. For a person suffering from hunger, thirst, heat, can't grasp an idea, even if it's communicated by others, much less can he arrive at it by his own reason. But when somebody has the first perfection, then he may pursue the second, undoubtedly of a superior kind, which is alone the source of eternal life. Intellectual perfection alone is the source of eternal life. Okay, coming to the end, folks, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. 
all these and similar laws, meaning all the mitzvot, just about all the mitzvot, must have some bearing upon one of the following three things. Regulation of our opinions, right? Understanding the correct perspective on reality, the improvement of our social relations, which implies two things, the removal of injustice and the teaching of good morals. Consider what we said of the opinions. Okay, we're going back to this, the regulation of our opinions. In some cases, the law contains a correct belief, which is itself the only object of that law. What's a correct belief? Belief of the unity, eternity, and corporeality of God. Okay, this is the move that he makes, folks. Here we go. In other cases, it is not a correct belief. It's a necessary belief. To secure the removal of injustice or the acquisition of good morals. Such is the belief that God is angry with those who oppress others. As it is said, my anger will be kindled and I will slay. What Rambam is saying here is that that belief is necessary for good morals, but it's not true. It's not correct. It just keeps people in line with an incentive to do good and a disincentive to do bad. Or the belief that God hears the crying of the oppressed. Again, that is not a true belief. It is a necessary belief so that people don't oppress others. Because if they did and those oppressed people would cry out, the bad guys might be afraid that God would hear their cries and deliver them from the hands of the tyrants. As it is written, and it will come to pass when he will cry unto me that I will hear, for I am gracious. Okay. So, I wanted to leave plenty of time today because this is pretty radical on the religious level. That the laws of the Torah were not communicated directly to Am Yisrael, to the entire people at Mount Sinai, that it was communicated or heard, in quotation marks, figuratively, by Moshe, who then wrote down laws that were for the welfare of the intellect and the welfare of the body. And when we're talking about the welfare of the intellect, some of those laws were correct opinions, and some of them were necessary opinions. And the ones that are necessary are not true. It is what Plato called a noble lie. It's noble because we want people to behave in a charitable, merciful, compassionate, righteous way for the best operations of society. But it's a lie because this idea that God punishes the wicked or God rewards the righteous or God hears the oppressed, that's not how God works. And since that's not, not how God works, when Maimonides said that prophecy is a natural quality, except if God wants to withhold it, right? That was another one of those places where, like, the idea of withholding prophecy from somebody is, is a punishment. God doesn't do that. So Maimonides is trying to write this guide of the perplexed without having his library confiscated, without being burned at the stake for being a heretic. So he's trying to write it in such a way that you have to put together these statements from different chapters and ignore other statements that seem to be part of conventional morality or conventional theology and understand who he is channeling in terms of Al-Farabi, in terms of Ibn Rushd, um, of Averroes, and in terms of Aristotle. So with that, Shirelle, let's open things up and you can help me with some questions. Sure. 
Um, so one is really about, you started referring to how he was accepted or um, um, what was the prevailing like other thought of the time that he was kind of uh, going against or different? Yeah. So in the Islamic world, in the Jewish Islamic world, you had a range and um, a range of theology, and that range would be exemplified by Saadi Gaon and Yehuda Halevi. Those are the people that came before Rambam, neither of which Rambam ever quotes, because he didn't have any respect for Saadi Gaon or Yehuda Halevi. So there were more traditional, conventional, rabbinic understandings. Yehuda Halevi channels that kind of racist, what will become a mystical worldview, that only Jews can prophesy. Gentiles don't have that inyan elohi, that divine component in their neshama. Gentiles can't prophesy according to Yehuda Halevi, and only Jews in Israel can prophesy because Israel has a higher level of Kedusha, of holiness, than any other place. Rambam thought that that was heretical, that that was idolatrous. The person who writes about that relationship the best is Menachem Kellner, called Maimonides' Confrontation with Mysticism. Sa'adia so Gaon is frequently associated with um, the Islamic school of Kalam, which is a kind of rationalist theology, but it's theology and not philosophy. And um, in 933, Saadi Gaon wrote the Book of Opinions and Beliefs uh, in Arabic, just like Yehud Halevi wrote in Arabic. Um, and he is more uh, reasonable when he can be, but he certainly maintains the divine speaking of the mitzvot at Mount Sinai. He certainly retains the idea of reward and punishment. And the goal of human beings for Sa'adia is not intellectual perfection, but it is a more standard and conventional um, ob obedience to the mitzvot and to morality. So those are the kinds of um, foils that the Rambam has within the Jewish world. Uh, backtracking to a question <laughs> for a moment about Moses, uh, because you mentioned Rambam said like Moses was the only one to be actually spoken with. So how does that go with God not having a body or not having a voice? And why was Moses an anomaly? Like, does he? Yeah. Talk about so that? Moses was spoken to God. Moses was spoken to by God figuratively. You have to read it figuratively because God doesn't speak literally. And why is Rambam an exception? Because Rambam, sorry, why was uh -huh. Moses an exception? Because he was the greatest prophet. He was the greatest philosopher. He had the highest level of intellectual perfection. Not everybody has the same uh, intellectual potential. And even within one's potential, not everybody meets that potential. Moses was the greatest philosopher around. And he had an imaginative faculty that was correspondingly rich so that Moses, like Plato's philosopher king, could translate the intellectual truths into a political program that pr would provide laws for the welfare of society. Okay, um, I'm continuing with questions. I wish, uh, Rav Shai, if you have a moment, just look at the comments or so, because uh, I can't read all of them and it's interesting to see what's going on there. Um, but here's a question. Um, Hesha, uh, should I, I don't so think I can see him. Mm, can I? Yes, but it's okay. Don't worry. I'll, I'll keep them. I'll save them for you. Um, and I'm, I'm doing my best to, uh, to share. Um, so there's a question about Heschel uh, distincting between prophet and prophecy. Does the Rambam uh, make that distinction? And is Heschel in that regard revolutionary? 
I'm not familiar with that distinction off the top of my head that Heschel makes. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, uh, um, okay. So when prophets prophet, prophesize, I don't know the, the um, <laughs> verb for Prophecy. that. Um, is it, um, are they making stuff up because it's necessary or like, where are they speaking from? If we uh, read it in the Bible, how do we reconcile that with what Rambam said? Yeah, I think that's hard. Um, but answering from a Maimonidean perspective, um, Amos, right, Amos of Tekoa, who was a shepherd, you know, he had a lot of spare time on his hands, folks, when he was out there in the hills shepherding the sheep. And so he was just like Abraham. He was figuring out that, you know, there's only one force that can move the stars and the planets. Um, and so when he is when he has a prophetic experience, first of all, it's in a dream, and he understands that in order for more people to have greater access to intellectual truths, there needs to be a change in the way that people behave toward one another, or there needs to be a change in the way people worship because those changes will result in a more stable, tranquil society that will provide people with the best shot of attaining intellectual perfection. Okay, so um, how with all these ideas does Rambam continue to be a devout practicing Jew, uh, yeah. how to do the mitzvot if they're if if he does if he sees them just as necessary for something else, because that something else is really important, right? He is a law and order kind of guy, even though he doesn't think the laws are universal, in the sense that this isn't what everybody is commanded to do because they were given at a specific moment in Israelite history for that community. Rabbis can update those laws for new situations, and that's part of what Maimonides does as a judge, but they certainly don't apply to non-Jews in other places. So there's nothing, the only thing that's universally true about the mitzvot are the correct opinions, because opinions are correct for everybody, not just for a particular people. And he believed, I believe, that the best shot that we have for a more orderly society and that messianic idea of peace in the world, which he absolutely pursued, the best chance that we have is by people following the mitzvot. If everybody followed the mitzvot, we'd all be in a much better place. I believe that, and Rambam believed that. And I think Yehuda Halevi believed that, and Saadi Gaon believed that. So I, I think the more difficult question is, when... Rambam says that the law of milk and meat and not combining milk and meat had to do with an idolatrous practice that the Israelites knew about from their time in Egypt that we were commanded not to do because we wanted to be separated and to have separate rituals from the idolaters. The harder question is, why do we still need to do that? If contemporary idolatry does not engage in a ritual involving the combination of milk and meat, right? Rambam is very conservative in that he says, even those mitzvot that no longer have a function because their function was historical, we are still commanded to do them and they're still, you know, they still obtain, right? They're still obligatory. I think that he was worried that once we start doing that historicist thing, that historicist move, that we're going to end up where some conservative rabbis are in the reform movement and the reconstructionist movement is, where there's a kind of breakdown in the authority of the commandments. So Rambam did not go down that road.
Okay. Um, can you clarify the connection or distinction between philosophers and prophets in the Rambam's thought? So there is no distinction. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's not exactly right. Let me let me make that distinction a little clear. You can have intellectual perfection and still not be a prophet because you haven't developed your imaginative faculty. So we all know people who are excellent intellects, but they can't communicate that to other people who are not. Part you can uh, you can under you can have a prophetic vision. I don't know. Maybe this is what somebody was talking about with Heschel. I'm not sure. You can have a prophetic vision and a prophetic understanding, so that you are you are at that level of understanding of the nature of the world. But if you can't communicate that to others who don't have the same degree of intellectual perfection because you haven't developed your imaginative faculty to the point where you can make analogies or where you can use language so that other people can come along with you in understanding things, even if they can't do the proof themselves, then you're not going to be considered a prophet by others because your knowledge will remain private. Okay. Okay. Um, there's a question here about religion as the opiate for the people, um, and how, like, we can, yeah, yeah, you're nodding. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, he, he's saying that God doesn't reward and punish, that that's part of the noble lie, that in order to keep people in line, there, the Torah has disincentives. We know disproportionately about those disincentives and incentives for good behavior because they are explicated in a thread of the a thread of authorship within the biblical books that is in Deuteronomy so scholars right bible scholars call that d for Deuteronomy we know that better that reward and punishment theology, we know that better because that's what the rabbis chose to be in the Shema, right? To be in the prayer book. That's the Shema and the Vahavta, right? Those second and third paragraphs of the Vahavta say that if we're not obedient to God's will, there will be a drought. And with drought, there is no food. And with no food, you are easily conquered, okay? But if you are obedient, then there will be rain in its season and things will be good. There is another theology in the Hebrew Bible that we're not going to talk about that becomes the operating system for the mystics, but not the philosophers. The philosophers stick generally with the reward and punishment operating system and then they just say it's a noble lie. It is a necessary belief, but it's not a correct belief. Uh, we have a couple more minutes, so I'm going to try and sneak a, a couple more questions. Uh, one is semantic. You were talking about correct opinions, uh, and there was a question if opinions is the accurate translation or what is like to make sure to understand. Right. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's a sloppy translation, isn't it? You could also say correct beliefs. I think that's probably better. So there are correct beliefs and there are necessary beliefs. Can I ask the word in Hebrew what it is? I I it's he wrote in Arabic. Because he wrote in Arabic. Yeah, I'm curious because Deot. Deot. Yeah, ot. Okay. Um, yeah, which is closest to opinions. And a last question, I think we can um how does one develop uh, imaginative faculties? Because obviously the intellectual part we kind of get, but you were talking about imaginative faculties. Is that something, uh, according to the Rambam, that a person can acquire? Is that a born thing? Like, where does that come from? What a great question. So the only time teachers say a great question is either when they don't know the answer, which is the case here, or when they asked the same question themselves. Oh, that's a great question. Um, let me get back to you on that next week. That's a good thing to, 
to know. I don't know if Rombaum ever talks. The place where Rombaum would talk about developing an imaginative faculty would be in his discussion of prophecy, which is in both the Guide of the Perplexed and the Mishneh Torah. Um, I will check and get back to you next week. Perfect. Um, okay, I think. Um, yeah, I think we 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 have it all. Um, thank you. This was amazing and a little insane. And yeah, I right. So you know, it's I, I told people like it. It just like how was this guy a rabbi, right? How was this guy somebody that people who seem to be you know black hats, um, the ultra orthodox, cite with such reverence. So let me just remind everybody that the Rambam they're citing is the Rambam of the Mishneh Torah, not including the book, not including that opening line, that that opening set of of halachot that we that we began with. They're they're not quoting the Guide of the Perplexed like ever, um, and they learn the Mishneh Torah, they learn the guidebook as part of their halachic learning um, that's incredibly valuable. I don't mean to deprecate it, um, but the Rambam that they are learning is not the Rambam that we are learning. Okay, thank you so much. I, I want it to be next Tuesday. <laughs> I want part four. Um, thank you everyone uh, for your questions and for phrasing them so accurately. I really appreciate uh, that. Um, looking forward to see you in our next programs and have a great day, afternoon, evening or night, wherever you are. Bye everyone. everyone.